Hi, Mike Aben here with a KSP tutorial. At the conclusion of the last tutorial, we left Valentina in orbit around Kerbin along with her vehicle, the Kerbal 1. The Kerbal 1 still has some fuel left over, so I figured we might as well put it to use by talking about transferring from one orbit to another. This will also give us an opportunity to not only talk about orbital transfers, but also Delta V. You won't get far in Kerbal Space Program before encountering Delta V, and it's good to understand exactly what it means. In the second part of the video, we'll actually go over the math behind calculating Delta V requirements for any orbital transfer. What I'm going to do is transfer Valentina from her current orbit of 80 kilometers to a circular orbit with an altitude of 300 kilometers. But before I do that, I want to take a moment to talk about energy. Because understanding orbital mechanics is all about understanding energy. An object in an orbit possesses two kinds of energy. The first is a result of its velocity. Quite simply, the faster an object is going, the more energy it possesses. Just think about hitting something and you'll quickly realize that velocity plays a huge role in the energy of the collision. We call this kinetic energy. The second type of energy is a result of altitude. An object falling from a greater height will impart more energy than an object falling from a lower height. This is called gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential plus kinetic energy is the object's mechanical energy. An object in a 300 kilometer orbit will possess more mechanical energy than an object in an 80 kilometer orbit. So if we want to get to the 300 kilometer orbit, we need to impart energy onto our vehicle. Remember, all we've got to work with is kinetic and gravitational potential. Changing our gravitational potential is very difficult. It's not like we can pick up the vessel and move it. And burning straight up away from the planet is spectacularly inefficient. However, as long as we have fuel, we can change our speed, which will change our kinetic energy. That is why getting where you want to in space is all about speed. As I want to add energy to our vehicle, we need to increase our speed. That means burning prograde, that is, in the same direction that we are currently moving. I'm going to set up a maneuver node and see exactly how much velocity I need to add in order to get my apoapsis up to 300 kilometers. I'm actually going to delete this node once I'm done with it. All I'm interested in is the number. Okay, there we go. 151 meters per second. We call this number the delta V of the burn. It's how much velocity I need to add to my vessel in order to accomplish what it is that I want. And in the second part of this video, we're going to look at how we can calculate what that delta V requirement would be ahead of time. That would be a very useful number to know. But anyway, as you can see, I've already deleted the maneuver node, so I'm just going to point myself in a prograde direction then go out to map view and I'm just going to burn forward until my apoapsis gets up to 300 kilometers. There really is no need for a maneuver node for this part other than figuring out what that delta V requirement was going to be. And 200 just about there There we go, that's good enough. As you can see, we now have an elliptical orbit with our apoapsis out at 300 kilometers and our periapsis at our original altitude of around 80 kilometers. This style of orbit is called a Hohmann transfer orbit. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna ride it out. Now, what I wanna note is our altitude obviously is going up, but at the same time, our velocity is going down. As we move up our orbit, it's like we're moving up a hill, is really kind of the way I like to think about it. I'm moving up a hill, so I'm gaining altitude but losing velocity. Uh, the kinetic energy that's associated with the velocity is being translated into gravitational potential energy, which is increasing my altitude. The key to this is that the total amount of mechanical energy is actually remaining exactly the same. Anyway, out here at Apoapsis, all I have to do is point myself prograde once again and burn until my 
periapsis gets up around 300 kilometers. You can see that I've set myself up a maneuver node, and this time I'm going to actually use the maneuver node so you can watch the burn from out here at this and enjoy the view from this higher altitude. You can see that the burn is about 148 meters per second, and again, stick around for the second part of this video. We'll talk about how we can calculate what that number is going to be. Just burn until that bar gets pretty close to the bottom. There we go. I'll switch out the map view. Well, I really did get right down to the bottom there. There we go. Let's get rid of that. Switch out to map view. And take a look at what our orbit looks like. Yeah, a little bit further. You know, that ain't bad. There we go, and that's it. Here we are out here at 300 kilometers. And getting Valentina back down to the 80 kilometer orbit is the exact same process in reverse, except this time, of course, we need to remove energy from our orbit, so we will be reducing our velocity by burning retrograde. After that, We'll just do the descent down to the surface, returning Valentina safely so that she is ready for her next mission. Oh, we're going to have fun with this. Let's do the math. Well, okay, I'm going to have fun, but I'm hoping that you will have some fun too. We're going to figure out how to predict the Delta V requirements for a home and transfer. This is spectacularly useful while playing. I use it all the time in my games to help me determine what fuel costs are going to be for a particular mission. Now I could just give you the formula, but really, what fun would that be? Understanding where the formula comes from is well within the grasp of KSP players with just a little bit of high school math, and is based upon just a few fundamental principles in physics that many of you are likely to already be familiar with. If you just want the formula, you can skip to the end of the video, then again, you could also just Google it. If you are still with me at this point, I'm going to assume you're in it for the duration, so let's get started. We'll start with what I've already mentioned, that the mechanical energy of any object in orbit is the sum of its kinetic and gravitational potential energies. The kinetic energy is equal to one half of the object's mass times its velocity squared, while its gravitational potential is the product of its mass, height, and gravitational constant, g. Both these formulas are common in high school physics classes, but we're going to have to modify the second one a bit. First off, height is a relative term that can mean a lot of things, so we're going to change it to radius, r, which is the object's distance from the center of the body being orbited, Kerbin in this case. Also, now that we're away from Kerbin's surface, g is going to change, and the formula for calculating g is this where big M is the mass of Kerbin, and big G is called the universal gravitational constant. Note the negative sign to denote that small g is always directed downward. Let's substitute this into our gravitational potential formula, and simplifying a bit by dividing out one of the r's and the r squared to get this. This gives us a new, handy dandy formula for calculating the total mechanical energy of any object in orbit. Let's see this formula in action by freezing the Kerbal 1 right after it had completed the first burn in its Hohmann transfer. Right here, our velocity is 2,444.8 meters per second, and we are at an altitude of 75,742 meters. Remember that r in the formula is the distance from the center of Kerbin. Kerbin has a radius of 600,000 meters. Adding this on gives us an R of 675,742 meters. Bringing back our formula, we can see that we still need two more numbers. The universal gravitational constant is 6.6741 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Don't worry so much about the units. And that's the same value that it is in our universe. While the mass of Kerbin is 6.2916 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. You can get this last number in game by clicking on Kerbin in the map view and selecting the info tab on the right of the screen. Substituting in, you'll notice that I am not putting anything in for the vehicle's mass. As it turns out, we won't need it in the end, so I'm not going to bother. 
pushing this through a calculator it gets negative 2.24 times 10 to the 6 m joules. There are a couple of things that may seem strange about this value. One is the negative sign. That's a result of a standard convention that has zero gravitational potential at an infinite altitude. Gravitational potential is all relative anyway. The second weird thing is the m, which looks like meters, but it's actually the m from the formula which represents mass. Because it looks strange, and is rather awkward to say, a common practice is to divide the m over to the left side of the equation, replacing the e for energy with an epsilon for energy per kilogram. You know stuff is getting real when Greek letters start getting involved. This gives us an epsilon of negative 2.24 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. Now by the law of conservation of energy, if we don't do any burns or dip into the atmosphere, this energy should be a constant no matter where we are in our orbit. For example, how about here? Our velocity is now 2,142.9 meters per second, and our altitude is 178,953 meters. I've modified the formula a bit by just taking out the little m's. Substituting gets us an epsilon of negative 2.24 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram once again. What do you know? KSP knows physics. Okay, so what? How does this get us the delta V requirement for a Hohmann transfer? Well, the crux of it is that the epsilon for any kind of orbit is a constant. So for any two locations in a, in a particular orbit, the two epsilons will be equal. Substituting in our formula, we get this, where v1 and r1 is the velocity and radius at one point in the orbit, and v2 and r2 are at a different point. Before going any further, let's clean this up a bit by getting the velocities on one side and the radii on the other. Also, both big G and big M are constants, so let's replace them with a single letter mu. This is a pretty standard thing to do. The mu is even given a name, the standard gravitational parameter. Substituting gets us this, and we can make it look a little better by taking the mu out as a common factor. This formula relates together the velocities and radii of two different points in any orbit. Now let's think about our elliptical transfer orbit to get us from an altitude of 80 kilometers to 300 kilometers. Let's make periapsis position 1 and apoapsis position 2. This means R1 is 680,000 meters and R2 is 900,000 meters. What we want to determine is V1, our velocity at periapsis. This gives us the velocity we would need to get up to 300 kilometers. And if we knew our velocity before making the burn, we could just subtract to get the required delta V for the transfer orbit. There's just one problem. We don't know what V2 is. What we need is another relationship between the radii and velocities. This relationship is given to us by Kepler's laws. Johannes Kepler was a 17th century German mathematician and astronomer who summarized planetary motion into three concise laws. The first law states that all orbits are ellipses, with the principal body at one of the foci of the ellipse. So here I have an ellipse with Kerbin at one of the foci. I should mention that Kepler's laws are a very good approximation of real orbits as long as the principal body is much, much more massive than the orbiting body. For example, a satellite about the Earth, or the Earth in orbit about the Sun. This approximation loses accuracy as the masses of the two bodies involved get closer together. For example, the Moon and the Earth relatively are close together compared to the Earth and the Sun, or even more dramatic, Pluto and its moon Charon. However, in KSP, all the celestial bodies are on rails, regardless of what masses you put in orbit about them. So KSP is actually a perfect simulation of Kepler's laws. Now, let's pick a point on the orbit close to periapsis. Let's say here. After some time period, the orbiting object will have moved. Let's say it's now here. The object is said to have swept out an area A1. Now let's pick a point out by apoapsis and wait the same period of time in which the object moves to here, having swept out area 2. Kepler's second law states that as long as the two time intervals are the same, the two areas are equal. Next, let's imagine that the time interval is very small. As the time interval gets smaller and smaller, the two areas get closer and closer to being triangles. 
As we're interested in the velocities exactly at periapsis and apoapsis, we can imagine the time intervals as being as close to zero as we want, and we can calculate these areas as if they were triangles. Those with a bit of calculus behind them have encountered arguments like this before. It's kind of what calculus is all about. For those that haven't seen arguments like this, well, welcome to calculus. So let's calculate area one. If the time interval is approaching zero, then the height of the triangle is actually the radius at that point, while the base of the triangle is the distance the object traveled, which is just the velocity of the object multiplied by the time interval. Of course, it's exactly the same story with area two. The area of the triangle is just one half the base times the height, so we substitute that in for our two areas to get this formula. The half and the delta t are common to both sides, so we can just divide those away, leaving that r1 times v1 must equal r2 times v2. This is exactly what we need, so let's get back to our formula. Recall that we need to get rid of the v2, but we now have a relationship thanks to Kepler. If we divide r2 across, we can rearrange it getting v2 equals r1 times v1 divided by r2. Substituting this into our formula gets this. I'll pause here a second and draw attention to the second term on the left side of the equal sign. All I did was replace the v2 squared with r1 squared times v1 squared divided by r2 squared. Okay, it's high school algebra time. Hang on. Let's clean this up a bit. I did a few things here. First, on the left side, there is a common factor of v1 squared, which I took out to the front. Second, in both brackets, I got a common denominator and combined the two pairs of fractions into single fractions. Okay, I want v1, so let's get, take that ugly fraction beside it and divide it over to the other side. Remember, when you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal, so I end up with this. Now I want to draw your attention to the denominator of the second fraction the r2 squared minus r1 squared. This is an example of a difference of squares, which can be factored into r2 minus r1 times r2 plus r1. Notice that there is another r2 minus r1 in the numerator of the first fraction. These two factors can be divided out and removed. In addition, the r2 in the denominator of the first fraction can be divided out with one of the r2s in the numerator of the second fraction. Doing the dividing out leaves me with this. Finally, we can combine the two fractions into a single fraction and then take the square root to get rid of the square on the v1, giving me this lovely formula. Oh, we're in the home stretch now. This formula calculates the velocity that is required at periapsis to produce a home and transfer out to our desired altitude. All we have to do is subtract what our velocity would be before the burn to calculate the delta v of the burn. This is going to require one more formula, and it is a pretty little thing. This calculates the velocity of any circular orbit. It falls out of the formula for centripetal acceleration and Newton's second law and universal law of gravitation. There is a wonderful video of, from the folks at Stand Up Mass deriving the centripetal acceleration formula. I'll put a link in the description. The rest, in the immortal words of almost every university math textbook, is left as an exercise for the reader. Anyway, substituting in, we get the following formula for delta v. Note there is a mu over r1 in each square root, so it can be taken out, finally yielding this formula. Phew, this is it. This will calculate the delta v required for the first burn of any Hohmann transfer. Let's put it to the test. In the video, we performed a transfer from an 80 kilometer orbit to a 300 kilometer orbit. Here are the numbers we need. Remember that mu is just the mass of Kerbin times the universal gravitational constant, and that the two r's are the starting and finishing radii measured in meters from Kerbin's center. So here's our formula. We substitute in, get out a calculator, and come up with a predicted burn of 150 meters per second. Let's check what actually happened. There we go, 151 meters per second. So how about the second burn that circularizes at 300 kilometers? So here's our first formula. Recall that we got this by taking the required velocity at periapsis and subtracting our current circular orbital velocity. All we do is the exact same thing at apoapsis. The only difference is that now our final velocity will be the circular one. So we subtract the other way around. This gets us this formula. 
If you compare the two, you'll see two differences. The subtracting is the other way around, and the R1s and R2s have been switched. Putting the same numbers into the formula gets us about 140 meters per second. And looking at back at the video, we actually see that the burn was 148 meters per second. A little off, but that's what often happens. The formulas assume that both the initial and final orbits are perfectly circular. My initial orbit in particular was pretty ugly, so that can throw things off from theory. Always budget a bit more than what the formulas give you. Man, if you're still here, then I'm assuming you found the journey worth it. Before I sign off, I want to draw attention to one more thing. At the end of my mission, you'll notice that my fuel reserves were pretty close to being spent. It's a good thing I didn't run out of fuel or else Valentina would have required some rescuing. Now, perhaps I just got lucky, or perhaps I knew exactly how much Delta V that ship contained at the start of the video. How could I have known that? Well, that will be the topic for the next video. I hope you enjoyed this, and that I'll see you again next time.